Uh, well, hello everyone. This is Dr. David, and tonight you are going to be treated to a wonderful presentation on cardiovascular health. And I know the title sounds a bit morbid, anatomy of a heart attack, but um, I think people need to understand how uh, cardiovascular disease starts. And uh, it's not, it's not, you don't, unfortunately, too many people wait to have an, an issue before they do anything about it. But I believe that when people understand how a disease starts, the small things that happen, those little drops that make the big ocean, uh, you, you, can, you, you, can, you, you will be better equipped to, uh, to minimize or to reduce the impact of those things. And so I think uh, what Dr. Lundell is going to be talking about t tonight will be fascinating and I think will be, will be fun and simple and straightforward. So we're really, really glad to have him on. Uh, remember, these presentations are not about a uh, substitute for your doctors, your expert health professionals' advice. Uh, if you are on any treatment, please, please, please be sure to go back and check with your doctor before making any drastic changes, doesn't matter how good the information or how good you think the information is. So very, very important for you to realize that. Our presenter, presentations are always, always, always about giving you a, a, a more complete picture. And, and we strive as much as possible to add not just the, the physical aspect, but also the, the, the spiritual and the emotional aspects as well. And really, and really, when it comes to heart disease or heart health, a lot of it has to do with stress. A lot of it has to do with the way you think. A lot of it has to do with your beliefs as well as your nutritional status and, your ex and exercise. So that's very, very important. And that's me on the left, obviously. And that's Sherry. And we're both, uh, we both started these webinars about three years ago. And they've been going strong due in no small measure to the help of people like Dr. Lundell. And of course, Barry Sears was on today. And uh, we'll, we'll mention him in a minute. But that's our goal, to give you the best, the most useful information uh, out there. It's not just enough to give you quality information. It's, it's also important to give you information that you can use when you need to use it. And for, to, that, uh, to that end, it has to be th something that the layperson can grasp. That's our mission, to help people better understand how their minds and, and bodies work. And as I mentioned initially at the beginning, that has to be the foundation. Because until you understand how those things, how, how, how your mind and bodies work and how disease begins, then it won't be, you won't be able to do the second part effectively, which means uh, choosing the right nutritional supplements, slow supplementation, choosing the right doctor, choosing the right chiropractor, naturopath. You need to be aware of all these wonderful tools that are out there, but the foundation, again, has to be your understanding how your mind and your body work. All right, I think we are still in good shape. Uh, I think, and it, it, folks, if you have any questions, please type in your questions. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's hearing me well. Will you see my screen, Doc? I don't see your screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> I apologize. I, I, I just got a notice saying, here, saying no one is seeing my screen. Okay, well, I think we can go on, but uh, please, I think I, I actually had the, okay, let's go back really quickly because it's, we are required to show this every time. Uh, excuse me, folks, and please pardon me. Uh, that's our disclaimer slide. Please remember to check with your doctor before you make any drastic changes. All right, I'm just going to skip on to the next, and here, there you go. Dr. Sears was on this afternoon, did a wonderful presentation on insulin resistance. And uh, that, that is available for you to purchase, along with his slides, of course. And as a matter of fact, he has done about three or four webinars for us in the past, and these webinars have all been compiled into what we call the Omega series, or the Zone series, and that will be available on our homepage for you to purchase at your own convenience. Just look, go to our homepage or click on the banner that says upcoming webinars and uh, you can access all his past presentations uh, in the Zone series. Okay, time for what we are really here for. Again, we are so, so, so blessed to have Dr. Lundell uh, take out of his busy schedule to uh, do this presentation for us. This is actually his third presentation. 
Now, I'm going to read his bio and then hand over to him. Uh, Dr. Lundell's experience. Now, let me start from, you know what, I think I, I clipped the first part, but I'm just going to keep, keep going. Pardon me. Dr. Lundell has had experience in both cardiothoracic, cardiovascular, and thoracic surgery for over 30, 25 years. And he has performed over 5,000 coronary bypass operations. He is certified by the American Board of Surgery, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Dr. Lundell was a pioneer in off-pump heart surgery. I don't pronounce my R's very well, folks, so you have to excuse me there. I, sh I probably should have been from Boston. Anyway, uh, he, he, he is a pioneer in off-pump heart surgery, reducing surgical complications and recovery times. He is in the Beating Heart Hall of Fame and has been listed in Phoenix Magazine's top doctors for 10 years. He has been recognized by his peers as a leader and has served as chief resident at the University of Arizona and Yale University hospitals, and he later served as chief of staff of surgery at hospitals in the Phoenix area. He is one of the founding partners, and this is impressive, he is one of the founding partners of the Lutheran Heart Hospital, which became the second largest heart hospital in the United States, and is now owned by Banner Health. Uh, this our presenter has, a, has so, such a long list of accomplishments, but I'm going to jump to the very end, which I, I think is his most important, or what he values the most. Dr. Dr. Lundell enjoys time with his children and grandchildren, and he competes in triathlons. He is the 2008 Ironman Arizona champion in the 65 to 69 age group, and he in the, and was 10th in the Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. It is with great honor and great pleasure that we hand over to Dr. Lundell. And Dr. Lundell, thank you so much again for, for gracing us with uh, your presence and for doing this presentation for us again. Uh, you should have received a window saying you, should, you have been made the presenter. Aha, I see it. You got it? Yes. Indeed. Okay. Very good. You might want Thank to. You, uh, you might want to take the slideshow. Put it on slideshow so we can see. Okay. The... All right. Very good. All right. Thank you. That's better. Yes, sir. Perfect. And thank you so much for having me, uh, Dr. David. I appreciate it very much. Uh, my passion is heart disease. My my career has been heart disease. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's a uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a morbid title, but. Uh, uh, we need to pay attention to it because uh, it, it strikes fear in a lot of us. It, um, uh, we've all known someone or know somebody who's had one. We may know someone who died of a heart attack. We um, hear it. We actually don't hear it enough in the news. If uh, if as many people died in an airplane crash as died of a heart attack uh, every day, we, the headlines would be and nothing but deaths from heart disease. So it's just critically important that we understand it. In, uh, <clears throat> and it's so important that uh, if you have one, that you get attention very quickly. And the symptoms of a heart attack uh, are called angina pectoris, or chest pain. And they, they often go to the left arm or the jaw or a variety of places that, that can be discomfort brought on either by exercise commonly or uh, sometimes they can occur spontaneously. But uh, if we have some of these pressure pains in the, in the left chest, in the left arm, or in the jaw that don't go away, we need to seek medical attention right away because there are things that we can do uh, to change this situation. And, uh, uh, we have sometimes we have progressive narrowing of an artery, which gives us chest pain, which you know can lead us to get attention. And more often, uh, a heart attack occurs relatively suddenly with no previous symptoms. And uh, 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 this is a sort of a gross picture. This is a heart of someone who died of a heart attack, and you can see uh, here that this heart muscle uh, is 
darkened and doesn't have the same normal color as the rest of it. And you see the blood clot here in the artery has deprived this critical area of the heart muscle of blood, and it's actually dead and dying. And so uh, that really uh, is what happens a heart attack. And here you see, uh, I'm sorry about the voiceover, but this, uh, the, the common situation is that we have a narrowing in the artery that doesn't produce any symptoms because it doesn't restrict the blood flow. And then suddenly uh, the plaque will rupture and a blood clot will form here. It's not always the, the junk, the, the, the yellow nasty stuff that goes out there. The plaque ruptures and then uh, blood is, does what it's supposed to do and it clots on any foreign substance. And so that's why you hear about clot-busting clot drugs and that's why you hear maybe you should take an aspirin if you have any of these circumstances because we know that aspirin uh, reduces the uh, ability of blood to clot just a little bit. So that's basically what happens in a heart attack is that the plaque ruptures, a clot forms, and it deprives the heart muscle of blood, and uh, then some very bad things happen. And most commonly the bad thing that happens is a ventricular fibrillation. Now you can see on the top the electrical signals uh, come from the upper chamber and progress down to the two lower chambers. And when you see this in real life, it's a beautiful thing. It's a synchronous contraction of this muscle that happens thousands and thousands and thousands of times every day without us thinking about it. But when the tissue is, uh, and each one of these cells in the, in the two lower chambers are capable of, of beating on their own without those signals. But when some of them dies, they send off so many electrical signals, we have what's called ventricular fibrillation. And opposed to the beauty of the synchronized muscular contraction of a beating heart, we have this massive muscle which just lays there quivering uh, because so many signals are going in so many different directions that it can't beat and it can't pump. And of course, if this goes on for very long, then uh, we uh, don't have any circulation and we're dead. And the sad thing is that this happens about every 23 seconds somebody has a heart attack. About every minute someone dies of a heart attack. And uh, 300,000 people every year have a heart attack as their very first symptom and they die before they reach the hospital. And uh, you know, a small town in uh, Minnesota or Oklahoma or Arizona is gone every day with 2,500 people. And so uh, the sad thing is we don't have a headline about it and we don't get concerned about it because it's so common. Now, you know, if we had that many people even die from auto accidents or gunshots or anything else, we would go crazy with trying to find a solution. Uh, but so far we've been happy with the solution that uh, that modern medicine has come up with, and that is that uh, this is a simple plumbing problem, and that cholesterol in excess in our blood slowly builds up in our blood vessels, much like uh, the corrosion might build up in the pipes of your house and slowly plug up the pipes or the drains or whatnot. And uh, you know, when I was uh, in medical school, there really wasn't very much we could do for these people. Uh, we had a few drugs, a few uh, diuretics, we had digitalis, we had really nitroglycerin and not much else. Uh, and that wasn't so long ago. But uh, when I was in school, a new, I, I mean, this plumbing model uh, was there, and so the way to fix it was to uh, use a plumbing solution. And so we would take an artery from inside the chest, called the mammary artery here, or a vein that we harvested from the leg, and we would use it to bypass the blockage, as you can see here. And that's why it was called a coronary bypass. And it would bring new blood supply to these areas of the heart muscle that were previously starving or potentially starving. And so really it was a pretty dramatic and a uh, pretty exciting field, and so as a young, uh, a young doctor, uh, I chose this field, and I, uh, I dedicated myself to heart disease because uh, 
Number one, it was killing half of all Americans. And number two, we now had a solution which seemed to be pretty dramatic and pretty workable. And so, uh, as I say, I decided to be a heart surgeon. And this, this is what we did every day. And I'm sorry, uh, folks, it's after dinner. And uh, <laughs> some of you might have to look away. I don't know. <laughs> The, the patient's head is at the bottom of the screen there, and uh, uh, this really is a miracle, uh, the human beating heart. This one isn't working so good right here on the front because it's not got enough blood in it. This is the typical operation using the heart-lung machine. This tube over here takes the blood out to the machine. This tube here brings it back. This is the vein that I'm sewing on the front of the heart. You can see the heart is completely stopped. And and basically, in hibernation, we packed it nice here. And, uh, uh, you know, this was a little technical exercise, which uh, fortunately I was pretty darn good at doing. Now, the heart-lung machine was a wonderful device, but it had many, many side effects. So a lot of us felt that if we could do this heart, do the same operation with the heart beating and avoid the complications of the heart-lung machine, it would be an advance. And in, indeed it was. Uh, my partner and I did a thousand consecutive cases without a single stroke, and normally the stroke rate would be about two or three percent. So uh, we just saved a whole lot of brain tissue uh, by using this technique called beating heart surgery, off pump surgery. Now, in spite of a lot of very hard work and uh, phone ringing every night for 25 years, and uh, many of these operations multiple times a day. I ended up considering myself kind of a failure because even though we lowered the mortality rate for men, we haven't yet for women, but we lowered it for men with our, well, with our dramatic interventions of heart surgery and angioplasty and um, uh, pacemakers and defibrillators and even artificial hearts and uh, temporary artificial hearts and transplantation, and all those kind of things which are expensive and dramatic therapies at the end stage of disease. Uh, basically, after all that work and after 5,000 coronary bypass operations, uh, really the total number of people with heart disease continues to skyrocket. And so, basically, I, I, I kind of thought I was a failure. And, and, and the idea that cholesterol is the ticket or the key uh, is just didn't make sense, especially uh, when you look at this new research published in January of 2009, which covers 137,000 people who were admitted to American hospitals with heart attack. And indeed, 75% of all of them had normal cholesterol levels. Let me repeat that again, because every time you go to the doctor, all you, <coughs> excuse me, you, you're Again, uh, the only thing that's emphasized is the cholesterol levels. But 75% of everyone with a heart attack has a normal cholesterol level. I'm so sorry, I got a little tickled throat. Um, take a break here, Dr. David, and I'm going to need a drink. Sure. Hang on just a minute. All right, folks, Dr. Lundell will be back shortly. <clears throat> this is fascinating information, really. That those pictures, for the first time, I'm actually really understanding what a bypass looks like with those wonderful diagrams. Doc, are you back? All right. I okay now. <clears throat> we might be a little, a little rough, but we're back here. I apologize. Uh, give me one more second. Go ahead and turn it off for one more second. Okay. All right. I've turned it off. I'm about to turn it back on. With this theory. It should tell us that something's wrong with this theory. That cholesterol just builds up our blood vessels because... 75% of everybody who has a heart attack has normal cholesterol levels. It doesn't make any sense. 
and all the studies that are done on Lipitor and Crestor and all the other statin medications really focus on events like heart attack and death from heart attacks that occur at the very end stage of this disease and yet you're told when you go to the doctor that uh, <coughs> you're told when you go to the doctor it's all about keeping your cholesterol under, level, under control and that you must take these medications to lower your cholesterol levels and so uh, really when you when you look at this that 75 percent of all those people's people had normal heart attack levels <coughs> Sue's covered earlier uh, about inflammation and how important it is I apologize. I don't know where that tickle came from. A little cold a few days ago, and I guess that's the last end of it. At any rate, I'm sure as Dr. Sears covered the importance of low-grade inflammation in not only heart disease but diabetes and a whole lot of other things, <clears throat> this information really came uh, forth in the medical literature in 1999 with a, the big article in the New England Journal of Medicine. In, with the headline, Ar arteriosclerosis is an inflammatory disease. And <clears throat> we know it is. Many, many cardiologists and other scientists have published extensively on the connection of inflammation and heart disease. And yet our focus is still on statin medications and lowering cholesterol. <clears throat> As I say, the real cause of heart disease has relatively little to do with cholesterol and everything to do with inflammation. So let's just take a quick look at what inflammation is. <clears throat> because, Dr. David, if we didn't have it, we would die from every infection that comes along. Right. Uh, every virus, every bacteria, every little wound would, would end up overwhelming us. And so, uh, let's suppose we're working uh, in the garden and we get stuck with a, a sticker, a splinter, that penetrates the skin and brings into our bodies bacteria, dirt, which fortunately our immune system would recognize as abnormal. <clears throat> the immune system then sends out a, a host of signals called cytokines, which orchestrate the entire inflammatory process from start to finish. They, excuse me, once again, give me one second. All right, we're back. Uh, at any rate, this bacteria and dirt would come in our bodies, and our immune system, thankfully, recognizes these things as abnormal and sends out signals called cytokines. Now these cytokines circulate throughout your entire body. Your, your whole blood volume circulates uh, about four times a minute. So these things travel very rapidly. And what they do is they tell the white blood cells here that are circulating in the blood vessel, you know, there's a problem. Get out here and fight the battle because these really are our soldiers. They're our warriors, our defense forces. And so our, the cytokines and some think changes that take place in the lining of the blood vessels tell these white cells to migrate out of the blood vessel, out into the tissue, and fight this battle. The interesting thing is the way they fight that battle is by actually consuming the bacteria. They eat them, they engulf them, and then they dissolve them. And so that's the basics of a very complicated system made quite simple that uh, the bacteria in the dirt are then eaten by these white cells and then as the inflammation settles down <clears throat> other cytokines are secreted which cause uh, chemicals to dissolve the uh, rest of the mess and try to clean it up. One, one second again. Well. Dr. David, you might ask me, I understand that perfectly, but what's that got to do with my blood vessels? And uh, 
uh, that would be a good uh, a good question. <laughs> okay. Well, let's <laughs> so let's take another look at this and uh, and we see that now this is the blood channel and this is the wall of the blood vessel. One of the things that happens with inflammation is the lining of the blood vessel gets sticky. It's like Velcro, and it's one of the things that happens to trap these white blood cells and cause them to migrate out of the tissue and do what they're supposed to do. And what they're supposed to do is if they encounter an invader, they end up eating it. Uh, uh, these are called macrophages, but they're also, as you know, called phagocytes, and that <clears throat> that word means to swallow in uh, Latin, so that's exactly what they do. Now here's where this old LDL comes in, the low density lipoprotein that we've now labeled so-called bad cholesterol. <clears throat> and that's what uh, we focus on completely, but about 85% of the cholesterol circulating in your bloodstream uh, is produced in your liver. And it's a normal substance that's used to carry cholesterol from where it's produced in the liver out to all the tissues where it's needed for a variety of functions. So we can't live without cholesterol. It's, it's necessary and it's normal, so it doesn't make any sense that having just a little bit extra of it would cause all these problems that we've been led to believe. Now, under two circumstances, cholesterol becomes abnormal. And if it becomes abnormal, then these white cells will recognize it as such and do what they're supposed to do and swallow it or eat it. <clears throat> and so if and those two circumstances are if the LDL is oxidized or if it's glycated, meaning it has a sugar molecule attached to it. Under those two circumstances, we actually can measure antibodies against the LDL. And if the antibodies are there, then it triggers a reaction to prove to these white cells that they're abnormal. They then consume it, <clears throat> and since they can't dissolve it, they become what's called a foam cell here. They, under the microscope, it looks like they're full of little soap bubbles. And so they become a foam cell. Now, a collection of these foam cells becomes what's called a fatty streak. And excuse me one second again. Now, a collection of these foam cells is what we call a fatty streak. And uh, I've seen this hundreds and hundreds and literally thousands of times. You open the blood vessel and you see the plaque, or hopefully you don't open right where the plaque is to do your repair. But we can see these little yellow streaks and stripes in the, in the back wall of the blood vessel, as you see uh, uh, depicted in this illustration here. That's the very beginning of heart disease. It's the beginning of the plaque. And uh, uh, I hate to break it to you, but you all have it because uh, an autopsy study done of 20-year-olds, 100% of them had a fatty streak either in their, one of their coronaries or in their uh, aorta, the main blood vessel. And here's what it looks like uh, uh, sort of in real life. You look inside that blood vessel and you see these... Uh, little yellow streaks of collection. Indeed, it is oxidized LDL. And it's dead uh, white cells. And it's a, a little mess that happens. And inflammation is going on there all the time. Now, Doc? Is, yes, sir. Does that happen because there are micro uh, cuts, small cuts within the lining of the, of the blood vessel? or um, how, I know you explained that earlier on, but... Uh, it's just hard for me to grasp how a 20-year-old would begin to form those so quick, so early in life. Well, uh, let's go back to inflammation. Inflammation is the response to injury. Okay. I'll repeat that. Inflammation is the response to injury. So if we injure the lining of our blood vessel, then inflammation is going to occur. The white cells are going to be activated, and if they encounter oxidized LDL, they'll consume it, and a, fat, a fatty streak uh, is the result. And so we'll lead into that exactly what is it that might injure this delicate little lining of our blood vessel, uh, and what can we do to prevent the injury, and what can we do to make sure this heals. 
so that we don't uh, build up these little fatty streaks into a plaque that then has the potential to rupture and cause us the heart attack, which we've been talking about. So we'll come to the things in, in a few minutes that really injure the little lining cells of our blood vessel. But the, uh, going back to inflammation, uh, once the invader is defeated, then these white blood cells have to do the cleanup process. And so they secrete some enzymes that, that digest the tissue and the collagen and the connective tissue so that it can be cleaned up. And this illustration is a, a knee joint. And, uh, osteoarthritis or joint pain is a big, big problem. And those of us who are getting a little older, and uh, we all think, well, we wore it out. But we didn't wear it out. Uh, it wouldn't wear out if this inflammatory process didn't dissolve the joint tissue, didn't dissolve the, the delicate uh, membrane that's in our, in our knees and elbows and joints and whatever. So inflammation really is the, what causes arthritis, even though we, we think we just wore it out. <clears throat> and once again, the, the blood vessel is really the brains of our cardiovascular system. We, we ascribe lots of things to the heart, don't we? emotion and uh, this and that and the other, but really it's a dumb pump. <clears throat> it just pumps what comes to it. Uh, yes, it can change its heart rate and pump a little more with, with exercise, but what really happens is these blood vessels dilate and contract or get bigger and get smaller. And uh, we must remember that flow equals pressure times resistance. And so if we lower the resistance and keep the pressure the same, then the flow goes up. And so basically the blood vessels really are the brains uh, of the whole system. And if we don't take good care of them, then the system isn't going to work uh, the way we'd like it to work. <clears throat> and so basically what happens uh, from the beginning is that we have this oxidized LDL. Um, hello, folks. It seems for some reason uh, Dr. Lundell was... Uh was was bumped off. I'm gonna to pause I'm gonna pause the recording for a second and then get get with him. Welcome to go to webinar. Web events made easy. Heart attack I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but but uh, you know it's uh, just as dramatic uh, uh, we we ended and that's uh, what happens with a heart attack is things end uh, unless treated and uh, corrected in the right uh, time. But at any rate, I was saying that, you know, this, this nice, beautiful artery that works uh, slowly gets uh, an accumulation of these foam cells and then a, a plaque that ends up rupturing and, and causing us to have a heart attack and uh, sometimes death. So what causes this inflammation? That's the fundamental uh, basis of the heart attack the arthritis, and uh, maybe, as you discussed earlier, the diabetes. And we know that we need chronic, we need acute inflammation to fight off uh, all of the invaders that are out there in our environment. Uh, and acute inflammation is a response to an acute injury, and chronic inflammation is a response to a chronic injury, and that would mean a small injury that happens over and over again. Now, there are many, many things in our environment that can harm us, and lots of chemicals and toxins and uh, bacteria and viruses and radiation and all sorts of things. But uh, when we look at the, the most important things that we can actually easily change, these are the big four. The excess consumption of simple carbohydrates, the excess consumption of vegetable oils, not enough consumption of fish oil and oxidative stress. And let's just take these one at a time if we can. Sugar and simple carbohydrates. A uh, hundred years ago, the average American ate less than 10 pounds of sugar. The consumption now is 170 pounds per person per year. Now think about that, almost a half a pound of sugar and simple carbohydrates per day. 
And we got there not because we're necessarily sugar uh, addicts, but we got there because of the recommendations that said we should have a low-fat diet, which <clears throat> means we had to replace that fat with another macronutrient, and that would be sugar. And if you don't think that excess sugar in our system and excess blood sugar uh, is a problem that causes a difficulty, think what happens to the poor person who has uncontrolled diabetes over a long period. They go blind, they lose their kidneys, uh, they lose their limbs, and ultimately they die prematurely of heart disease. Now, I snuck in last night and took a picture of Dr. David's pantry, and here it is. <laughs> Close. <laughs> uh, not really, but it might be lots of pantries for lots of people. Uh, uh, and, and it just illustrates how the, these kind of things with, with flour and sugar are just everywhere. Now, uh, I hope there's some mothers in the audience tonight, and uh, I want to ask you a question. Would you give your child uh, nine teaspoons of sugar out of the sugar bowl at the breakfast table? And most of the time when I ask that question, uh, the mothers are horrified and say, no, I would never do such a thing. But guess what? If you've let your child drink a soda or you let your child drink a sweetened uh, juice drink of some kind, you've done exactly the same thing. Nine teaspoons of sugar per Coca-Cola or per whatever soft drink it might be. And this is really the largest source of the added sugars in our diet, our soda pop. And your teenagers are out there getting the, the super big gulps, and that might be as much as 32 to 36 teaspoons of sugar at one sitting as they down that big gulp with their fries and burger. Uh, and uh, the next topic was vegetable oils. And how did we get in that circumstance? Well, we were told way back that we should never eat any more animal fats because it had cholesterol. It had saturated fats. And uh, our official governmental dietary advice was to avoid cholesterol, avoid saturated fat, avoid red meat, avoid anything, and uh, we should change our diet. Well, this resulted in us consuming a lot of vegetable oils, which we we're told were healthier. Now, we need a little bit of omega-6 in our diet, which comes from vegetable oils. And predominantly, we're talking about uh, soybean oil and corn oil. Uh, they are the biggest sources of omega-6 and, by the way, the largest source of trans fats in our diet. <laughs> Some people have estimated that 20% uh, of our teenagers' calories come from uh, vegetable oil with uh, the fries and the cookies and uh, the sweets and everything else they eat that are, are made with vegetable oils. Uh, once again, these things are cheap, they're convenient, uh, they don't spoil, and uh, they've just become a huge part of our diet, which we never had in our diet until uh, 50 uh, or 60 years ago. And are they important? We can actually measure the level of omega-6 in our tissue. And if we go to uh, Greenland, the tissue levels are 30 units. And the heart attack death rate per 100,000 is 20. We come to America where we slightly more than double this rate, uh, the level of omega-6, and we have 10 times the heart attack rate. Uh, and the reason is the overload of omega-6 causes inflammation, hmm. and it causes the production of those eicosanoids that uh, I'm sure Dr. Sears talked about. Right. And it's really about balance. Uh, historically, we, we should have had uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s for us to have healthy cell membranes and have healthy responses to inflammation. But when we get overloaded with sixes the way we are now, with a ratio of about 20 to 1, <clears throat> then we have chronic inflammation. And uh, we've gotten away from eating uh, seafood uh, and our, our meat and our milk and our eggs uh, don't have the same levels of omega-3 that did when our animals ate grass. And we just don't get enough omega-3. It's estimated that about 80 
to 85 percent of our population in this country is deficient in omega-3. And omega-3 is really uh, an anti-inflammatory as much as omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory. And we just don't get enough of it. And it's not just for the heart. It's, uh, it's uh, successful in the uh, supplementation with good doses of omega-3 are, are important in controlling high blood pressure, and irregular heartbeats. It's critical brain development in uh, infants, children. Uh, it's been shown to reduce the level of Alzheimer's disease. It's shown to uh, reduce depression change depression if we treat with uh, uh, enough omega-3 and it plays an important role in diabetes so uh, it's about getting enough omega-3 and about reducing the amount of omega-6 in, in our diet to stop this inflammatory process and fourth on the list was oxidative stress and once again it's about balance <clears throat> oxidative stress simply means that we have more free radicals than we have antioxidants now, what's a free radical and where do we get them? Uh, a free radical is basically uh, an atom that's missing an electron. And this makes it very unhappy. And it becomes a thief and it goes out and steals an electron from its neighbor. Now, an antioxidant is a molecule that can donate an electron and make this free radical happy back into a stable molecule and itself remain stable. So that's the difference between antioxidant and a free radical and how they change. Well, the fact of the matter is uh, if you like oxygen, you make free radicals. And if you don't like oxygen, you can hold your breath for the rest of the presentation. What happens in this little energy producer in our cells, and it's called a mitochondrion, is we take oxygen and we run it through this process and we strip off an electron. And that then goes to produce, in conjunction with uh, glucose, uh, energy. And so we're making, as a normal consequence of our metabolism, we produce tons and tons of oxygen-free radicals. And uh, not only uh, is the production of free radicals a normal metabolic, metabolic process, but we have all these outside influences which can increase the production of these free radicals. We have radiation and sunlight and air pollution and cigarette smokes and, and, and even inflammatory process leads to uh, the formation of free radicals. And if they're not controlled by an adequate number of antioxidants, then we get tissue death, we get uh, tissue damage, we get cell death, and ultimately we get DNA damage, which leads us to premature aging, premature aging of tissues, and the possibility of some cancers occurring. So to sum it up, this is the worst dietary advice in the last hundred years, the USDA food pyramid, that we should eat all of this simple carbohydrates in, the, in bread and pasta and, uh, and sugar. And this is really the cause of our epidemic of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and all the rest is the bad dietary advice we've received. <clears throat> Inflammation causes not only heart disease, but strokes, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease, uh, depression. And that's interesting because uh, it's in, these cytokines actually go into the brain and uh, they tell us to behave differently. In animals, it's called sickness behavior. In humans, it's called depression. And, uh, uh, inflammation causes it, and as we've mentioned, arthritis. And I've been guilty of it, but if you have any of those problems and you go to the doctor, you generally get another prescription. Uh, now the question then becomes, have you got solid or low-grade inflammation? And if you can answer yes to two of these questions, you probably do. Are you significantly overweight? In males, is your waist over 40 inches? In females, is 35 inches. Are you already on medicines for high blood pressure, high cholesterol? Can you not make it through the day without another bagel or Krispy Kreme? Are you more tired than you ought to be? And do we have a poor dental hygiene with uh, untreated uh, cavities and gum disease? Do we have more aches and pains than we really ought to have? Now, there's one blood test that we have to check the levels of inflammation in our body, and that's called a C-reactive protein. 
So as you look at this list, you can see that a whole lot of us uh, probably have a certain level of low-grade inflammation because most of us will answer yes to two of these questions. As I read this article in 2002, after wondering why am I not winning the war against heart disease, I'm winning battles every day, but I'm not winning the war. And then in 2000, uh, in 1999, when the article came out that inflammation is the real cause of heart disease, I began to be begin to look around for a better way to do this. How are we going to change this? I mean, I can keep fighting these little battles, but I'm losing the war with heart disease. And this was kind of the aha moment that ended up changing my career. What if one day someone could devise a way to halt the chronic destructive results of low-grade inflammation? And that led me to uh, write the book, The Cure for Heart Disease, to try to explain to people what really was going on, that it was inflammation that was destroying our blood vessels, that inflammation was that initiated the plaque, made the plaque grow, ultimately made the plaque rupture. And so uh, that led me to change my career, to uh, end my surgical career and start doing some things different, teaching and lecturing and trying to get people to read this book. And uh, inflammation really means fire inside. And so these are my fire extinguishers. Uh, we, we have omega-3 uh, from fish oil. Uh, the two critical components of omega-3 are EPA and DHA. And we must get at least 500 milligrams a day of these combined uh, elements of omega-3. Our antioxidant vitamins are important, and those are the A, the C, and the E. B vitamins are critical too, and more and more important, uh, we're realizing how important vitamin D is, and we don't get enough of that. Colorful fruits and vegetables have compounds in them called polyphenols. And these are the building blocks uh, that our body uses to make its own antioxidants. The other fire extinguisher is to get some exercise. We didn't understand until recently that exercise actually is anti-inflammatory. When we move our muscles, uh, they produce chemicals that are anti-inflammatory. And so grandma said it was good for us, but we didn't know until recently why. The reason is it's anti-inflammatory. And weight control. We know that when we overload fat cells, they uh, end up uh, producing chemicals that cause inflammation. And so it's important that we stop gaining weight and stabilize and maybe lose just a little bit is all it takes really to change our inflammatory status. And of course, as much as we can, we should avoid those vegetable oils. Um, Doc? Now, yes, sir. Um, Dr. Garcia has really, really emphasized the importance of uh, the, the plant polyphenols to be taken in addition to the omega-3s because uh, obviously for the antioxidant effect, but specifically because the polyphenols and the omega-3s seem to have a synergistic effect. But I, I, just, uh, I, I just thought that was interesting that you, you, put, you, you place them together too in, this, in, this, uh, in, in, your, in your inflammation fighter uh, schedule. Well, I, I'm delighted that we agree because they they really are critical to allow our body to make uh, its own antioxidants. And uh, uh, so the polyphenols are really critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, one of the ways that uh, uh, lots of things happen is by oxidative stress inside of each cell. And so uh, while it's a big topic, it really uh, comes down to, to making sure uh, we get enough uh, colorful fruits and vegetables. Uh, Vitamins are good, but we really need these polyphenols, which come from colorful uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. <clears throat> now, as a part of my career change, we ended up uh, producing a product called HeartShot with our little company, Asante. <clears throat> but it's, it's uh, magic in that it tastes good, and uh, you can take it once a day. But uh, the ingredients really are available at, uh, at any health food store. It's just omega-3 and CLA and the antioxidant vitamins. And uh, 
uh, uh, Mary Ann Cooper, who's helped sponsor this tonight, can tell you how to get some of this product. But um, uh, you can get it at a, you can get all these separate ingredients, which I encourage everybody to get uh, at a health food store anywhere. Now, talking about antioxidants, uh, guess what? The largest single source of antioxidants in the American diet is. <laughs> wow. Nobody would guess coffee. They always guess blueberries or blackberries or strawberries or something else. <clears throat> and one of the reasons is that uh, coffee is rel naturally relatively high in antioxidants, but we'll have three cups of coffee a day, but uh, it might be weeks or months between the time we have a whole bowl of blueberries. And this is the reason it's the big source. <clears throat> now, antioxidants, and I'm sure maybe Dr. Sears come to this, there's a lot of marketing hype about them. Uh, the real questions are these three. Are they absorbed into our system when we eat them? Are they metabolized into anything that's important and that it means are they there to be the building blocks uh, to help our body uh, with antioxidants? And then do they really do anything? Do they neutralize free radicals? Do they do anything else when they're in there? So there's a lot of marketing hype about antioxidants, but we must ask these three important questions about all of them. Now, the coffee antioxidants indeed are polyphenols. And these polyphenols we know are absorbed. Uh, we know they're metabolized. We know they fight free radicals. <clears throat> and when I began to learn about coffee and its uh, influence on health, the critical thing to me was that these polyphenols, particularly chlorogenic acid, prevent the oxidation of LDL. Go back to the beginning of our discussion. If LDL was not oxidized, it would not be consumed by those white blood cells and never get into our blood uh, vessel walls and cause the plaque, which ends up causing a heart attack. Coffee also helps us with our glucose metabolism and has been shown to reduce the chance of diabetes in those people that drink four to six cups a day. So coffee is really as common as it is. It, uh, really is a fascinating uh, nutrient now, and who would have thought it was a healthy beverage because most of it thought it was a guilty pleasure. <clears throat> now, you can see that the antioxidant capacity of uh, coffee is, uh, you know, five to eight times higher than teas, black tea and green tea, and uh, so is significant. And uh, this uh, Asante Java coffee, uh, that uh, we market and that you can get from Marianne has six times the antioxidants of any other coffee, and we've proven this by tests from an independent laboratory. And the way we do that is uh, interesting. The unroasted coffee bean, which you see here, the light colored or the green beans, uh, are very, very high in antioxidants. And over here are the nice, uh, colorful, uh, aromatic and tasty coffee bean that would make it to our coffee cup has to be roasted at 450 degrees or more. And here's what's happened to the polyphenol contents when we roast coffee. We might reduce uh, the amount of polyphenols which contain the antioxidants by as much as uh, uh, be down to one-tenth after we do a dark roast. So the healthy roast process by which we make the Asante Java, we, we have a process whereby we extract the antioxidants from the unroasted bean, then we roast the rest of the beans, and then at the end of the roast process, we uh, take this solution, which is rich in antioxidants, and put it back on the beans. And this is the way we achieve the high antioxidant content of Asante Java. Now these are the six most concentrated antioxidant foods that you can get in a study by the uh, <clears throat> Department of Agriculture on about 1,600 foods. You see the blackberries, walnuts, strawberries, artichokes, cranberries. And interestingly, coffee is on this list as number six <clears throat> with 2.9 millimoles per serving. And blackberries up there at 5.7. But by our triple patented process of Asante It looks like he's been bumped off again. <laughs> Hang on, folks. Millimoles per serving, and our pet triple patented process uh, means that uh, 
a cup of Asante Java has uh, about three times uh, more than a bowl of blackberries, a cup of blackberries. So it, it becomes a very important uh, source of uh, polyphenols. And uh, so we've we've talked about the bad dietary advice we've had from our government, our health authorities. Uh, the bad medical advice about emphasizing cholesterol alone. And so I just put this last picture up here to remind you to enjoy your cup of coffee. And if you enjoy coffee, why shouldn't you drink the world's most powerful antioxidant coffee? And enjoy your eggs and enjoy your uh, uh, proteins and cut down the carbohydrates and the vegetable oils and we will lower inflammation and we will be healthier. And I'll turn it back to you, Dr. David. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Another fantastic presentation. You made some things seem a lot clearer to me that years of medical school and medical training <laughs> never did. <laughs> so thank you again, Doc. This, this has been fantastic. We have lots of questions, I know. Uh, folks, go ahead and send, send in your questions, and I'll be sure over here to read them out. Uh, we actually had some questions being sent in before the presentation. And by the way, uh, if you are interested in uh, ordering the coffee, as Dr. Lundell said, Marianne helped to sponsor this particular program. And I have tried the coffee too. It's fantastic. The company, Asante, has, uh, has in addition to Dr. Lundell's hot shot and the coffee, some other fascinating, fascinating nutritional technologies that I think you should ask uh, Marianne about. But of course, start with the coffee and the hot shot, because that, of course, is very, very, very important. Uh, Doc, quick question about uh, that, the part about the heart attack and how uh, the blockage in the blood vessel. Is there, first question, uh, why is it more uh, fatal in women than in men? And the second question is, and I hope, hope I'm right about that. The second question is, uh, is there a particular blood vessel in the heart, one of the coronary arteries that is more prone to uh, block it than the other, others? Uh, the heart attack isn't necessarily more deadly in women. It's quite deadly because surprisingly, uh, heart disease actually kills more women than all cancers combined. Hmm. One of the reasons that the the death rate from heart disease is higher in women is because we've typically thought of it as a male disease. We thought females were protected by estrogen uh, until they uh, went into menopause when heart disease rates rise in the women. So unfortunately women uh, get their symptoms ignored. Uh, they're, they don't get treated as quickly. They don't get uh, the medical response if they do have significant heart disease as much as men do. So that's why the mortality rate is a little higher for females. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, someone sent me a question. It says you've trained and you've done uh, over 5,000 open heart surgeries. So how did you determine inflammation was the cause of heart disease? Could you see it? How did you know it was the cause? <laughs> <laughs> I know you read it. Uh, well, that's an absolute great question. It's interesting how these things converged. Uh, uh, I was quite happy uh, as a young surgeon uh, applying this uh, coronary bypass because it worked, and saved lives, and it put people back to their families and back to work. But often I would look uh, down at the heart and I would see that the coronary artery was was uh, had the same signs of inflammation that you would see if you got a wound on your skin. And those signs uh, are redness and swelling and warmth and pain. Of course, I couldn't uh, see pain. And uh, I couldn't tell that one part was warmer than another, the way you can on your skin when you have inflammation. But I could definitely see the swelling. And I could definitely see the redness around the coronary artery. And then <clears throat> uh, in the late 90s, when the research began to come out, and I began to look at it, and I began to uh, research it very uh, hard. Uh, the research then uh, reinforced the observations that I had made in the operating room. And the other thing is I was just frustrated that I would do an operation and then six or seven years later they would be at, back for another operation with the same cholesterol levels. Mm. 
So in other words, you were dealing with the leaves but not with the roots of the problem. Uh, correct. And this is, you know, modern medicine is really good at treating these, uh, this and many other diseases at its end stage, but we're very, very inefficient and poor at preventing anything. Right, right, unfortunately. Okay, uh, how much does open heart surgery cost today? And they also added stent surgery, pacemaker, defibrillator, and uh, do these devices and future surgeries actually halt inflammation? Do they attack the roots? Apparently not. So, well, uh, yeah, that, that answer is correct. Uh, a stent, uh, a bypass, does not stop the disease. Uh, in, in fact, uh, a wonderful example of, of medical therapy and surgical therapy uh, of heart disease is uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney. He's uh, been through at least five heart attacks. Wow. He's, obviously uh, well-to-do and was uh, in high government positions, so he had the best medical care in the world. And yet, uh, <clears throat> uh, all of these procedures didn't, never cured him. He's right now, uh, he exists and survives with a partial artificial heart. Uh, and he uh, has to carry around a battery pack, and he's got a, a pump, uh, a mechanical pump doing his heart. So. Uh, that's really the course of heart disease and how poorly we treat it and how the that things we do uh, uh, don't don't really cure it. Another example is uh, former President Bill Clinton. Uh, he had bypass surgery in '04 after he left off uh, left office, and yet uh, a year ago or so after the Haiti earthquakes, he was back and he had uh, chest pains again and he had uh, a couple of stents put in. So. It was not curative. It, yes, it saves lives. Yes, it puts off the symptoms. But does it cure the disease? The answer is absolutely no. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Wish pe people knew this. Okay. Though not all, many with heart disease can have syndrome X. First of all, what is that? And two, um, is high blood pressure related to inflammation? Okay, I'll answer the last one first. High blood pressure is related to inflammation. Uh, I'll go back to my, uh, well, go back to inflammation. If you've had a cut or a, a sticker on your skin, you saw that the, the uh, area around it was swollen and was not flexible anymore. And when we get inflammation in our blood vessels, the same thing happens. And when the blood vessel doesn't expand and contract with every heartbeat and reach down on your wrist and feel your pulse, that pulse is your artery stretching and contracting a little bit with every heartbeat. <clears throat> and if the artery is inflamed and stiffened and has extra fluid in its walls and is beginning to have those fatty streaks, then it can't uh, dilate and contract with every heartbeat and then it becomes stiff. And instead of this beautiful dynamic uh, vessel, it becomes a solid stiff pipe and that's what uh, really is uh, causes high, high blood pressure. Uh, it's got relatively little to do with salt although we're just hearing more and more about uh, salt in uh, these days but uh, inflammation really is the key to uh, to high blood pressure. Hmm. Hmm. Okay well I mean you did mention that cholesterol was not the, the key issue but however high cholesterol is still a bad thing right? Yes, high cholesterol is associated with heart disease. There's no question about it. But we must remember that association doesn't mean cause. Hmm. Uh, hurricanes are associated with high winds, but the high winds are really caused by uh, temperature differentials in the air and the ocean and uh, those kind of things. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's kind of a silly example, but uh, and maybe not a great one, but. Uh, association doesn't mean causality. We must remember that. Uh, it's just too easy to say that. The statin drugs, uh, by the way, are the only drugs on the market that are approved uh, not because they change any disease, but only that they lowered cholesterol. They didn't have to prove that they reduced deaths or heart attacks. They only had to prove that they lowered cholesterol. 
and uh, I've called uh, statin drugs the Bernie Madoff of drugs. <laughs> you know, he uh, uh, he uh, defrauded people out of fifty billion dollars, but uh, in my opinion, people are defrauded of thirty billion for statin drugs alone and a hundred billion a year for testing of cholesterol yeah. every year. So I, I I think statin drugs have outdone Bernie Madoff. Oh boy, that that much, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, not to mention the side effects. I mean, the the effects that uh, the damage done by the the continuous use of those side effects. Oh, uh, I doctors tend to ignore the symptoms from statins because, uh, and I'm not blaming the doctor. It's become the standard of care because of the the successful marketing of uh, of statins by uh, the drug companies. They've They've made it the standard of care, and so your doctor's really forced to recommend them to you. Uh, but the side effects are often ignored, and they're they're more than anybody in the industry or the profession wants to admit. And I've recently become acquainted with Dr. Dwayne Graveline, who's written many books. He was a, an astronaut and a physician uh, who was put on statin and experienced uh, global uh, amnesia. He couldn't. He, although he was a physician and trained as an astronaut, he couldn't remember where he was, and he. Yeah, so he's written extensively, and I've recently um, posted a, a couple of articles on his website, uh, space doc, space doc dot net. And so, if you want to see about statin side effects, just go visit his website, and you'll be amazed. He got uh, global amnesia simply from taking a statin. Absolutely. Huh. Now it came back. It was temporary, and then he was—he's discontinued the drug, and he went back on him, and it happened again. Yeah, well, that's 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 that that proves it, I guess, the connection. Huh. So not only do they not do anything, not only do they not cure anybody, not only do they not really change heart disease very much, they have lots and lots of side effects, which we. The medical profession and the industry tries to hide. Right, right. <sighs> oh boy. Okay, diabetes. Obviously, diabetes makes you uh, compromises you in several different ways. Now, is diabetes also related to inflammation? It is. Uh, in lots of ways, when we raise our blood sugar. Uh, we injure the lining of our blood vessels, and when we injure tissues, then inflammation happens uh, as a response to that injury. The lining of our blood vessels, the retina of our eye, and certain cells in the kidney uh, don't have to have insulin to take in sugar. In other words, uh, the sugar inside this, those three particular cells are the same as it is in the bloodstream. And so when we get a very high level of glucose or sugar inside of those particular cells, it causes oxidative stress and it causes those cells to die. And that results in inflammation. And that's, those three particular cell types are the reasons that diabetics go blind and lose their kidneys and uh, uh, as the main complications. Mm. Mm. And, and have heart disease and peripheral vessel disease. Right, right. Hmm. Um, okay, someone, Werner, wants to know if ultrasound screening shows that our arteries are very clean in our carotid and ankles. Hmm, what is the likelihood of heart, heart, uh, of uh, heart art arteries being blocked? This is a uh, strange question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the ultrasound examination of the carotid artery or the brachial ankle index, which is a measure of the blood pressure between your arm and your leg, uh, both are pretty good what we call surrogate markers for coronary disease. In other words, if, you, uh, if your coronaries are plugged up, you probably have heart disease. If your coronaries are pretty clean, you probably don't have heart disease. So uh, it, it, it's uh, the plaque and inflammation doesn't occur just in one part of our body. It occurs everywhere because the cytokines circulate everywhere. 
And so those tests are very, very good markers for heart disease. And if uh, you're fortunate enough to have a, a healthy carotid artery, then the chance of you having heart disease are relatively small. That makes sense. Now, now, Doc, I know you, you, you're, you're trying to downplay the importance of your, uh, of your technology, uh, heart technology, uh, o over others, but I, I, would, I would beg to differ with you that uh, I don't think we should send people to the, to the health food stores and just go pick up any, any combination of the products that, or, or the nutrients that you mentioned. I think, I think that positively could, in, in some cases, they would, they would be rather off not spending their money at all. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't come here to, to uh, you know, to sell a product. Uh, right. Uh, although I'm very passionate about uh, the results we get from HeartShot. The unique thing about HeartShot is by using the microencapsulated form of omega-3 and CLA, which is a conjugated linoleic acid, and by making it so that we take this powder and pour it into water or milk or whatever our favorite beverage is, we end up instead of 14 to 20 pills, we end up with one single dose per day uh, of a nutrient that actually tastes good. Mm. And uh, so we know and, and you've known uh, that if you prescribe a medication that the patient needs to take more than once a day, the compliance level goes way, way down. Right. And so this is why I created HeartShot the way it is, because it's once a day, it's one, in, it's one uh, pill, if you will. It's not a pill, but it's a powder. You can take it as a drink. But it's once a day, and it tastes good. You don't have to hold your nose to take it. It's delicious, and it gets all those nutrients in your body in a form that can be absorbed very readily. And so... Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and, uh, and brag about it because, uh, you know, as dramatic as uh, heart surgery is, as I travel around the country and, and meet with people who have been taking heart shot, uh, I'm actually more gratified by the results we're getting out of people doing the right kind of nutrition than I was with heart surgery because I didn't have to risk their life, I didn't have to put a scar on their chest, and I know that it's actually a real <clears throat> it's changing the fundamentals of the disease rather than just putting a band-aid on it. Right. Are you there, Doc? Yep. Okay. Uh, and I, 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 I know we have to let you let you off soon. I mean, you've really. <laughs> uh, I, I'm surprised you you you've, you've actually stayed on. Um, we will certainly. Um, there's just one or two more questions. I hate to keep you in um, to keep you any longer, but you mentioned the double micro encapsulated EFAs. Now that actually helps to heal or to um, correct those micro um, abrasions and and correct the inflammation there. Does that do that? Yes, omega-3, particularly the two components that I mentioned, EPA and DHA, are anti-inflammatory. Now, you can take two approaches uh, to inflammation. You can avoid getting injured, uh, which in our modern life we can't do, or you can modulate the response. And omega-3 and the other ingredients we put in heart shot, and the polyphenols and the coffee for that matter, all modulate the response that we have from those injuries that we can't avoid uh, because we live in a, a modern world. And, and so uh, the omega-3 uh, ends up uh, being metabolized into compounds that reduce inflammation. And uh, Dr. Sears can certainly be more eloquent about the eicosanoids and the arachidonic acid and you know all those things that are way complicated. And I like to keep things simple by just saying that the omega-3 in this particular form gets absorbed more readily than a gel cap and is more effective because we've combined it with the other ingredients. So uh, whether you take omega-3 supplements or whether you have some, uh, some fatty fish every night, um, 
just make sure you get at least 500 milligrams of EPA and DHA every day and make sure you get lots of those colorful uh, fruits and vegetables uh, and get those polyphenols and once again coffee ends up being a great source because we do drink it every day no matter what. Right, right. Well there, there you go folks, That's that's that sums it up. <laughs> it, it, in in a in a, in a caps, in an encapsulated form, we've got the the keys to heart health. And uh, Dr. Landell, again, thank you so much. I know you had a, a, issues with your throat along the way. Thank you for sticking sticking with it and and for keep keeping for keeping keep on keeping on with what you're doing. And I we just have my my hats off to you for what you've done and what you are doing. Um, it takes a lot of courage and character. To, to face the truth and begin to proclaim it the way you have in, in, the, in the face of tremendous opposition, I'm sure. So thank you again for doing this. Uh, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And folks, uh, thank you for joining us. And please be sure to check with uh, Marianne if you want to investigate further. And yes, Werner says, great info again. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, I think it's fantastic. We are so blessed to be doing what we're doing with this being able to bring out bring information for, out from such people like that. All right, folks, uh, be sure to join us tomorrow and Thursday. We've got a couple more wonderful web webinars lined up for you. God bless. Hey, by the way, Linda Domini, thank you for, for sending in those questions. Those were excellent questions that you sent in. Great stuff. All right. Good night. God bless. Have a good day. Good evening.